What a wonderful God we have. Yes. I can't tell you that I'm excited. Amen. Amen. How many here the, know the law of sowing and reaping? Okay. You know that about your finances because you're givers. So you sow and you reap, right? How about love? If you want more love, what should you plant? Amen. If you want more excitement, what should you plant? All right. Here now I'm getting right down to you. Okay. Listen. Do you only whistle when you're happy? Maybe you can't whistle at all. Let's say, do you only hum when you're happy? I hope not. Do you know that if you're smart, you'll hum to make yourself happy? If you ever have a lull or ever in a situation, you don't let that rule over you. You take what you have in Jesus and you rise above it. How would you do that? You start looking up. What was the first thing this year God said to us? He said to where? Look. Where to look? See, and see, if we don't obey his word, we'll be in trouble. Because read over there in Hebrews 12, it says that if we don't listen to the word was spoken now, that shakes the heaven and the earth, how shall we escape if we neglect that? It's so, if you're not so happy, make yourself happy. Stir yourself up. Don't sit around and go by what you feel. Get your eyes off the world, off of what's wrong with everything. You know God told you that there was going to be a lot of wrong with everything. And so we don't want our eyes to slip because, remember, your eyes are cameras. Did you know your eyes don't see? Your eyes just bring in light. Your mind sees. It separates the light. And somehow you can get a picture. Hopefully it's the same picture of all of us getting. Can you say amen? So God wants our eyes to be single. He wants our body full of light. And in order to do that, we have to uh, obey his word. So we're to lift up our eyes. Can you say amen? Now listen. There are some sad things that have happened this, this week. And it's kind of sad. But, you know, if we just put our eyes and our mind on that, you'll be sad too. And that's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to pray about that, give it to him, let him take that, and you be glad, not sad. And the reason being is we want to take our focus over things, off of things that seem to want to control our moods. Come on. And ladies, I'm really talking about ladies too. Because you go through that extra thing. Remember what Adam gave us? You go through childbearing and, uh, and the change of life and all that. Now, I'm convinced this is a joke. I'm convinced males go through the change of life too. I, I, I am. We go through some kind of thing, you know what I mean? Even though we hadn't bo some, bore something as beautiful as a child or anything. I don't know what it is, but God help us. Amen. Are you blessed? All right, so... I want to share one more thing to you, and these little truths are kind of like a prelude. And that is, how many here know when you take medicine that it's supposed to help you, right? Okay. So if you take medicine that the doctor prescribes and you react to it, that's not a good thing, is it? Hello? Is that a good thing? No. You need to respond to the medicine. So I want you to get the idea with reaction and response. Everyone say reaction and response. Now, when the situation happens to us, maybe it's not pleasant, maybe it is pleasant, do we react to it or are we, we going to respond to it? Now, we can both react and respond. Happy things are we react and, and happy. But when it comes to the negative, who's the author of brokenness and negative? Okay, he, remember, he monitors your visual. He watches you, okay? Now, I'm going to sh share this. He, he's not always present. He's not following you around behind every bush. He's not doing that. But when you get productive for God, when you start seeing answers to your prayer, people's lives coming together, if you have a ministry such as maybe Scott and Christy does, and you all do have an important ministry, okay, you just need to find out what that is and get after it. You are become valuable. So the enemy goes, oh, no, Peggy's really valuable. I'm going to give her a thorn in the flesh, a messenger, one of my little boo-boo-boos. 
you know. And so he tries to get that in on us so that we'll submit to that and we'll come under whatever that dictation is. And if he can't do that, he'll suggest stuff. Sometimes he can suggest negativity all day long. You've got to recognize where that come from. Amen. Sometimes he can use people. I found out that I, I literally cut the devil off from coming to me personally. I just had an incident a while ago when I was marrying uh, Scott and Christy, but I haven't had one of those for years. To cut the devil completely out of your life and out of your family's life. I've been able to do that with God's teaching and instruction. I want you to do that too. But every once in a while, we'll leave a little hole and we'll, our eyes will begin to slip down. And we'll start to behold other things. Why God? How come God? Why me? You know, and then you become a little bit open. So everyone say, eyes up. Eyes up. Off of the world. Off, the world. Off of your husband and wife. There we go. Eyes up. Okay. All right. Now, the second thing he said is to draw closer. This is something you have to want to do. You have to want to draw closer. Don't just draw close because you're hurting. Draw close because you want to take another level of step. Can you say amen? You're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. So God encourages us to draw close to God. James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You resist the devil and he will, he didn't say duke the devil out. He didn't say scream at the devil. This is where people miss it. The devil is not afraid of you, Sherry. He's not afraid of me. He's afraid of God in me. He's afraid of my relationship with the God in me. He's afraid the very fact of that will shake his boots and stomp his face. And any time he starts messing with me or my family, I just turn him loose. Amen. Meanwhile, I walk in him. Everyone say, turn God loose and walk in him. All right. Let's get into the lesson, okay? the fruitful believer the fruitful believer now this came right from the throne of God and we're doing this series called reigning in Christ reigning in life in Christ and now we're going to learn to be how to be more fruitful everyone say amen all right so we're going to be reading our paragraph and as they get that set up I want to read my paragraph to you okay so blessings to your church family amen God has given us a fresh vision for this year to look up Draw close and let God take us deeper. Can you say amen? With that fresh vision, he wants us also to learn to thrive and to flourish and how to receive the things of God. And we dismiss our class today. Bless you guys as you go. Amen? I was hoping to get the first part and then the dismiss. That's okay. All right. So here's, here's the thing. I got a little bit distracted here. Amen. So God really wants to guide us. He wants us to provide for us. He wants to take care of us. He wants us to flourish. Now, let me ask you, how many of you have ever planted things? Have you ever planted a plant? What happens when you take a plant and you pull the plant up and then you replant it? And then after a little while, you pull it up and then you replant it. 
And they pull up and then you replant it. Remember we're trees, the planting of the Lord? What happens? It either dies or it becomes messed up. I mean, just withered and everything. So God, you need to, we need to bloom where God plants us. Say amen. And we need to stop looking around and start looking up. Finding out what God wants us to be a part of. How he wants us to move within believing for our children to be saved. Our families to be saved. Someone say amen. He wants us to grow up into him. He's brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It would be a tragedy for you and I not to share the good things that God has done in our life. Amen. Remember, it's not what you're doing for God What's God doing in you? That's the key. What God does in you will be exactly what he wants you to do and things you want to do. Just let him lead. Can you say amen? Just let him take the lead in your life. Don't worry. What does the Bible say about worrying? It says, take no anxious thought. Take no anxious thought saying, I don't know what we're going to do. Jesus says, look, I'm going to teach you disciples how to walk the way God wants you to walk so that the enemy touches you not. Can you say amen? I, only God can teach us that way. I can't teach you how to keep your walk in such a way. God has to teach you personally how to keep your walk flourishing and blessed. Say amen. All right, so we're going to cover these four areas. Today we'll cover God looks for fruit in the earth, number one. God looks for fruit in the earth. He's not looking for anything else. Two, we were, or excuse me, where are we planted? We're to bloom. Wherever we are to planted, we're to bloom. Keep that, that scripture up there. Okay, so where we are planted, we are to what? Bloom. Okay, three, the seed and the fruit is the spirit of Christ. When we see the seed talked about in the scripture, we talk about the fruit that God is after. It's the spirit of Christ. Can you say amen? And then fourthly, God checks the fruit and the harvest. Always checks the fruit and the harvest. Daily he checks your fruit and seeing what kind of part of the harvest you're a part of. I didn't know that, Pastor Kerry. Let's go over them again. God looks for fruit in the earth. Two, where we are planted, flourish and bloom. Three, the seed and the fruit are really the spirit of Christ. And then fourth, God checks the fruit and the harvest. See, I got it. All right, so let's look at the first point. God looks at the fruit in the earth. Go with me to Luke chapter 20. I'm going to get the scripture. Hold on. Go to Luke 20. All right, let's read our scripture. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. All right. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar. That's straight and true. In Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house where? Come on. Everybody just kind of reads over that. You see, God wants you in church. He wants you with the God's people. He wants you loving God's people. He wants God's people getting on your nerves so you can learn to work with people. And you're rubbing each other and you're learning and you're growing because we're family, folks. You can't choose your family. You have to love your family. You can't run around correcting your family. you got to love your family. Are you with me? Isn't that good? Amen. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still, I love this part. All of us can rejoice in this one. 14, they still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh. Everyone say fresh. Oh my, my, my. Have you ever met a still Christian? Their lips out and they're looking down. Yeah. And not only that, they argue and they're frustrated in the flesh all the time. Oh, boy. Bring them to church here. They'll learn. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Fifteen, to declare. Why? To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my 
a rock. Uh, amen. We, we've shared enough about the rock. And, and there is no unrighteousness in him. How many here are in Christ? There's no unrighteousness in you as long as you follow Christ. There's plenty of mistakes. But see, God does not look at you as a sinner. He looks at us as his child. So how many here had children? How many here have grandchildren? Maybe great-grandchildren like several of you. When they do something wrong, do you throw them away? Do you kick them through the goalposts of life? No. Why does the church treat their people that way? And how dare you treat leaders that way? Do not criticize God's property ever. Just forget about it. You might not like the preacher you see on there. And I've heard some bad things. What are you listening to it for? Huh? It's poisoned so many people. They don't know who to trust. That's not God. Look what it says. They shall be fresh, flourishing, declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There's no unrighteousness in him. So again, we're going to cover those four areas. You got them written down? All right, let's look at point one. God looks at the fruit of the earth. In, I told you to go to Luke chapter 20. Look at verse 9. Okay, and it says, Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard. By the way, the vineyard is the earth. The certain man is God. Okay, just so you know ahead of time. Okay, and leased it to the vine dressers. Adam, people, who did the world be give, was given to? The human race, through Adam. Say Amen. And you know what? The vine dressers are still here. It just depends on what God they serve. You see, that's human beings. And it says, to the vine dressers, those are the ones that take care of things. And he went to a far country for a long time. Now, at, at the vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers. Hello? A prophet. Maybe somebody from the Old Testament, like Abraham, and some of these people to bring forth good news. And they said that, that, he, that he might give some of the fruit to the vineyard. Okay? Remember, it belongs to God. But the vine dressers beat him, sent him away empty-handed. What's he talking about there? How does man treat Christians? I mean, carnal man. Hello? Pretty rudely. How, do, how does the world treat Jewish people? You see, the, this is the enemy. Just so, let's forget about the Christian and the Jew for a minute, and let's just look at people generally. The devil's job is to get them to turn against God, turn against each other, so he would have an engine to feed him and feed his power. You see, he feeds on wars, rumors of wars, arguments, stress. Hello? getting you upset. He feeds off of you like some kind of sucking demon. Now, if you get a good picture of that, you'll stop doing that. Come on. Well, look at the church. Is the whole church green with each other? A little bit bigger than what we can handle because there's millions of Christians, millions of Jews. So what do we do? We pray and ask God to go in and begin to cause the right things to operate, rebuke the devil and remove him. Our, our, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against two, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, Ephesians 6. Now, the thing that we need to realize is these vine dressers are human beings. They've been given authority and responsibility Hello? Leaders of countries, leaders of cities, okay? And God expects fruit. Can you say amen? From every human being. He expects goodness and, and praise and thanksgiving that you're alive. You're not dead sitting in some alley somewhere with a needle in your arm. You're alive. He wants fruit coming off your lips. Fruit of our lips, the fruit of our praise. Are you with me? So he's looking for food in the earth. So he sent somebody. 
to gather fruit so he could sample it, and they beat him. Sound like the world to you? Next time a, a Kirby vacuum salesman come over, don't beat him. Joking, just joking. All right. Don't kill the messenger, right, BJ? Ah, yeah. uh, bless your heart. So let's go on and continue. This is really good. But the vine dressers beat him, sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also and threatened him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third. And amazing, God works in threes. And they wounded him, also cast him out. I asked the Lord, how come, how come they did that? They were hoping that they, those servants would go back and tell the master, leave us alone, we're taking over. Sound like what's happening to the country? Yeah. Move on. Let's move on. I don't want to hang there too long. All right, let's read on. Verse 13. Then the owner of the, vi uh, the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Who do you think that is? And what did we do to the beloved son? Let's read along. That probably they will respect him and they will, as they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves selfishness, the sin of selfishness and sin. They reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir, come, let's kill him. That he, the inheritance may be ours that this world will take over the world. I love parables because God has showed me so many of them. So let's reveal some more to you. And so they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He'll judge them. He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give them the vineyard to others. Now, let me just share this. The entire end of this story, you and I get the world back under Jesus. And there will no more be a devil or hurt or shame, no more darkness. So we'll go to heaven first. We'll hang out for about seven years. He'll get us all trained. We're going to come back with Jesus. We're going to land in the Mount of Olives. He's going to consume the Antichrist. And he set up a millennial kingdom for a thousand years. There'll be still human beings left. You and I are no longer human. We're now become immortal. You don't believe me? Read 1 Corinthians 15. This death will be swallowed up in victory. This mortal will put on immortality. Hello? Read it. It's wonderful. It tells you, just like Jesus. How many here remember what Jesus was like when he was resurrected? He passed through walls, traveled at the speed of thought. You know what's so neat about the speed of thought? It's much faster than the speed of light. Why? Because you, speed of life still takes time, you know, time and space time, you know, between this part and that part. But while you're traveling in the speed of life from here to there, you could be thinking a thousand different things in a thousand different places at the same time. Because up in heaven, as you think, it becomes. You won't have any fear. There won't be negative stuff. So you will not have any ability to do anything against God and his kingdom, say amen. I'm looking forward to that time. God looks for fruit in our life, though. Are we bringing them complaints? Are we bringing them fruit? Are we doing our best to help people? And even if they don't take your help, don't be hurt by it. That means that maybe you're planting, somebody is going to come along and water. Somebody is going to come along and plant some more. Somebody's going to come along and water some more. But it's God who gives the increase. Amen. Isn't that good? Now listen. So the owner came. He says, I will destroy those vine dressers. Look what's happening right now. God put every one of us, every one of you, we all have responsibilities. We all have certain things we oversee. Family, job, right? Each other, you know, love. Right? So there's a certain amount of responsibility and accountability about how we do things. Say amen. And what does the world say? If somebody keeps doing the same dumb thing over and over again, the, Bible, the world calls them what? And think they're going to get a different set of results? Crazy. Yeah. 
So if you continue to repeat the thing that it doesn't work over and over again, you're being controlled by something else and not in control. Say amen. Do you find your moods moving up and down? Hope not. You should be leveling off in your walk with God. Say amen. Do not. Remember Adam, when God confronted Adam in the beginning, what did Adam do? Well, first he was hiding. Don't hide from God. Run to him. Second of all, he made excuses. It was the woman you gave me, God. Don't make excuses as a Christian. Don't blame. He blamed his wife and God. I'm this way because of you, God. No. No. No, you're not. You're that way because of the choices you made. You say, hello. So basically, we need to not blame so don't blame others and don't blame yourself. You just get with God and have him start fixing you and continue to fix you. And believe me, you'll be pleased. Why does it take some people so long to be fixed? Because they don't spend the time they need to be with God. It's just a simple answer. Who's our fixer? Who's our physician? Who's the author and the finisher of our faith? Who cares so much about us that he died for us? Rose again the third day. Sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Jesus Christ. Amen. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, the earth and its fullness belongs to the Lord. But the world system belongs to the devil. He's the God of this world system. Two, our Heavenly Father is looking for as many souls as he can receive. Are we out there winning souls, touching lives, and sharing our faith? Hello? i got to get my, my water. The only thing about going back up on the stage is it's nice to see my back. <laughs> you know, anyway, moving on. Three. Once a person receives Jesus in their heart, they become God's property. Do you, do you agree with that? Whose property are you? Next time the enemy tries to come your way, you just tell them, take your hands off you. You belong to God. And if he trespasses again, God will smite him. Hello? Do you think Satan has, can disobey God? No. Nope. Do you think he can even resist God? No. See, somehow the enemy tries to paint like, you can rebuke the devil and... What if he doesn't go away? Where does that stuff come from? I've never had that happen. Before I can even rebuke, he splits. He can see it rise up in me. See, I'm weaponized. You're weaponized. Use your weapons and stop thinking about it. Start doing it. Say amen. You can think yourself out of all kinds of wonderful blessings. Don't be thinking so much. Trust not your own understanding. All right, and fourthly, we are now become fruit bearers. Say amen. Our job is to produce fruit, fruit, fruit. So somebody looks at, at Scott and say, man, you're a fruity. Hello? He's got fruit coming every way. What does it say in John 15? Herein my Father's glorified that we bear much fruit. John 15, 7. And so shall you be a disciple of God. You can tell a Christian from a disciple. A disciple is totally sold out, totally a student, always learning every day, always throwing themselves in. It's okay. And you can be married and still be a student. You can be, have a full-time job, be a student. The other words, in other words, you're studying God. You're studying God. Jesus came down to give us an example so we could study what the Father was like. They didn't remember in the Old Testament, they had no clue what the Father was like. They thought he was mean and irritable. Hello? Hello? Even the Jews. Just look at their little journey. 11-day journey from out of Egypt down into the promised land. It turned into 40 years. Huh? What happened? Moses went up into the top of the mountain and went and sought God for the plan to get across into the promised land. But this, what did the Jews do? Peggy remembers this. They came to Moses, and they said, Moses, when you go up to talk with God, you tell him we're his buddies. 
You can count on us, Linda, and we'll just fix that thing up right away. And you got to babysit them. Hello? And so God's looking at all this pride. And so when Moses came up, he's got one idea. I'm going to get instructions for the Israelites. Yes, hallelujah. And he's right. But not the instructions he wants. Gets up there and what does God hand him? The Ten Commandments. What did they say to him? We can do anything God asks us to do. You see the humor in that? They came up to the boat. You go up there and tell God we can do anything he asks us to do. We're ready to go. So God says, oh, let's see if they can keep these ten. Now, come on, you've got to laugh with me. Are you fo- is your eyes up or are you focused on yourself? Gosh, don't be tricked. Your emotions are not God. Say amen. amen. Your emotions are not God. All right, they're good, though. You can control them. Amen. I'd rather move by my emotions than have my emotions move me. All right, what did James say? James said this on the same point. In James 5, verses 7 and 8, Therefore, be patient. Remember, God is looking for fruit in the earth. He's looking for fruit in our life. He's looking for good things. And you bring him good things. Every day you do. Just don't concentrate on all the things you're not bringing him. Concentrate on what you do bring him and lavish on him. But look what it says. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Listen to this. Who would be the farmer here? James is talking about God. He planted us, didn't he? We're called the trees of righteousness, righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Isaiah 61, I think, somewhere about verse 4 or 5. And he says, who waits for the precious fruit of the earth. How many here are praying for your children? Don't stop. Don't speak what's obvious. Start thinking. Thanking them for the fruit that God is going to bring through them. And please get out of the way and stop stomping on the plants. By your conversation. Well, I don't see any change on my kids. I just stop stepping on all the flowers. Say amen, somebody. I try to do that so nobody feels, you know. Anyway, so let's go on. So James says, he waits patiently for it until he receives the early and latter rain. Everyone say early and latter. Early means before and latter means later. That's talking about the coming of the Lord. Just before the church was born on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his spirit and his his early rains. What did it do? People got born again and people started getting saved From Pentecost on, they got born again. Jesus rose from the dead. That's the early rain. How did the church grow early on? Really well. Until about Acts chapter 5, and then the enemy found and enrolled through Ananias and Sapphira, and other people, by the way. But God still is bringing forth fruit. Can you say amen? Right up to this day, and in your life. Amen. What a wonderful thing. Amen. And it goes... Now, you also be patient, established in your heart. For the coming of the Lord is like the fruit that God waits for. (laughs) Amen. So, right, what are we doing right now? Are we thinking of ourselves or are we reaching people? I mean, God will put people right in front of you for you to say something. I mean, nowadays... The time is short. So he's trying to guide people right into a place where they can hear about being saved. And thank God you know how to lead somebody to the Lord. If you don't, I have a little sheet back there to show you how to just read from the sheet right there into Jesus. I make it easy as best as I can because God wants it easy. Notice you didn't have to do 50 push-ups before you got saved. Aren't you glad? <laughs> How about a chin up or two? I don't think I could even get up halfway up there, you know. Anyway, so let's just laugh a little bit. Point two, where we are planted, we're to abide in bloom. 
where we are planted, we're to abide and bloom. Or let me reverse it. Bloom where you're planted. Don't pluck yourself up. Don't get mad at people. Don't jump around. Don't, don't shut yourself off because you're running yourself and you're in big trouble. You're supposed to turn your life over daily to God so he can run our lives and keep us out of trouble. Say amen. So go with me to Isaiah verse 61, verse 3. Here it is. The Israelites are broken. They're backslidden. They want to know if there's a God. And so here it's a prophecy about Jesus coming, but he prophesies about our health too. Listen. About our being born again, being God's planning. He says, to console those that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for, for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of what? Do you feel heavy? Start whistling and make yourself happy. Don't sit there like that. You're just tipping the devil off. Satan reads your face. Even if you feel like death warmed over, put a smile on your face, a little milk up, makeup, and make yourself shine. Don't say, put out your lip down your continents, thinking of yourself, and put up a sign and say, come and get me. Because that's what that is. We reflect our thoughts. And I really reflect. Look at my face. You can tell right away if something bothers you. You know, you know, I'm just demonstrative that way. All right, so let's go on. So he says, the garment of praise through the spirit of heav uh, heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that they may be glorified. You see? So you are God's tree. God plants you. You grow in four directions. There's a lot of parables, shadows, and all kinds of good things in there. But then he goes on. Point one, church, God desires to plant us where he can, where we can grow and develop. It might not be where you want to go. That's why when we choose our church, it's kind of dangerous. Okay, we want to, we really want to be where God wants us to be so we can grow and get what God wants us to get. Say amen. And if you just trust him, he'll do a great job with you. Two, we are his trees, not our trees. He plants us. We don't plant ourselves. We allow him that grace to make our life better. Say amen, somebody. The next scripture I'll give you is in Psalms 1, verses 1 through 3. Very familiar. I call this the separation psalm. All right? Psalms 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. That means you don't take your information and your teachings from the world, from the ungodly. It's bad enough you go to a doctor that's not saved. You better pray for them. Maybe get a second opinion somewhere else quickly. There you go. It's not, God doesn't consider that. He wants you to get in a different realm where he can fully flow through. So you might want to check that out. That's for piggy, so I'm telling you those, you know, so you understand. Okay, let's go on to this. All right, so... He says, blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way or path of sinners. Now, this is, this is kind of a loose translation here. It literally means don't act like the world. Don't stand like a sinner. Don't stand with sinners and act just like them. When it says stand in the way of sinners, it also includes don't keep people from coming to God. Hello? Remember what I told you my dad said to me? He says, son... Two things I want you to never do, and, and I'm going to only cover the second one, was to never make fun of God's people or never put God down or do anything anti-God. Would you promise me that? And I says, yes. So even if I didn't have Jesus, I still did not put down those that did. Hello. And guess what it got me? Saved. All right. Amen. Don't put things down. 
if you can't say anything good about him, don't say anything. I'll pray about it. Amen? If you don't like the way I put dress, just tell me my hair looks good. I, you know what I'm saying? Why do we go that extra mile to irritate somebody? Let's not do that anymore. Amen. I never did that in the person. Sure, okay, so let's go on. Then he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What? So you, we, we, we in the New Testament can, can replace law with principles. How many know we're not under the law? We're not under obligation. We've been given Jesus. We operate in grace, and we, we are told to act on the principles of the kingdom. Say amen. So it says, but his delight is in the principles of the kingdom or the law. And <coughs> excuse me of the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. How often? Why? Folks, our mind is a computer. And if all you have is your past and all the negatives dwelling in here, and you don't feed the word in here, it has nothing to operate on but your past. And an example, how many know that people put things in compartments? Compartmentalize. If you don't believe me, look at the military. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, and it's evident. Hello? Unless it's a need-to-know basis? Okay. Now, here's the problem. In, in us following the Lord and, 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 and being compartmentalized, oftentimes we learn that way, too. We learn a section at a time. So be patient with yourself as God puts that puzzle together in your life. He wants you to grow up complete, whole. He doesn't want you to be a lopsided, undeveloped Christian. Can you say amen? You're his child. My goodness, he loves you so much. Say, God loves me so much. Okay. Now, he says, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That means that God will plant you in a very flourishing place. Hello, can you say amen? Because you're not acting like the world, because you're not following the world's ways, because your eyes are on God, God will plant you near the waters. Amen? And look what else. He shall be like a tree planted by the waters. It brings forth its fruit. What is God looking for? Fruit in its season. Listen, it's you moving yourself around, reacting to the world that keeps the fruit down. You need fruit explosions. Hello? <coughs> <coughs> I swallowed the wrong way. I'm, I apologize for that. Anyway, so, and it says, he be tree planted by the rivers of water, brings forth its fruit in its season, and whose leaf also shall not wither, and look at this next phrase, whatever they do shall prosper. Wow. Now, that's pretty basic. Where do we need to be? Planted and bloom where God plants us. You are sitting at a great big well. It's a little teeny one right now, but it's deep. Now, why aren't you bringing others who are thirsty here? Hello? Ooh, I would bring that up. All right, let's move on by our next point. All right, like a tree planted by God, by the waters, rooted and grounded in love. That's us, To, If we stay consistent and abide with him consistently, that's where we develop and that's where fruit grows. Fruit does not grow on the bark, on the trunk. It grows on the branches. Amen. You are the branches and I am the vine. No branch can bear fruit except it abide in me. Amen. And so we do. We want to be with God as often as we can. We're not away from God. We're just not aware of him more like we should. So the more aware of God and the more you converse with God throughout the day, the better the grace of God will help you along the way. And now I'm a poet. All right, let's go to the next point. The seed and the fruit of the Spirit is Christ. Go with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 14, and then verse 20. 
Mark 4. 14 and then verse 20. Verse 14 says, And the sower sows the word. You are a sower. Jesus is a sower. Preachers, teachers, everybody that shares Jesus is a sower. And what's the seed? It's the word. Can you say amen? And the word is Christ, and Christ is the word. So, and the sower soweth the word, and verse 20 says, And these are the ones on good ground who hear the word, accept it, and they bear what? In, in fact, it says in Luke and in Matthew, much fruit. Much fruit. Amen. All right, go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at the fruit of Christ. You guys know this scripture. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 25. But the fruit, not fruits, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Everyone say self-control. That doesn't mean you control yourself. That means yourself is under control of God. Don't get it mixed up. Endurance or long-suffering doesn't mean suffering long. It means having the ability of God into you to sustain you under every circumstance and hold you up. So these fruit portions are important that you understand them in the light that they are written. So let me teach you just briefly, but something important. Who lives in your spirit? Okay. These are fruit portions of Christ. Christ is broken up in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, temperance, or self-control, and faithfulness. Okay? So our spirit with God in it has to flow out of love and joy and peace, long-suffering. Can you say amen? Now, here's what's wrong with the church. Everybody's trying to love somebody the way Jesus would love them, but you can't do it in your own strength. It doesn't use the word for human love. It uses the word for God's love, agape. And it says the fruit of the Spirit is agape, God's love. If you're a born-again, loving Christian, the thing that should be most obvious in you is the fact that you're full of love. Say amen. And you say, well, I don't feel very loving at the moment. See, you're going by feelings. Nothing more than feelings. No, you got all the love you need on the inside. His name is Jesus. You got to let it out so that the love of God sustains you and keeps you. For God is love. Second is joy, doesn't it? You know, sad Christians are an oxymoron. Or maybe they're just morons. I have no idea. Don't get mad at me. We're supposed to be happy. Our sins are forgiven. God's not on our case every morning and every night. He's loving us and helping us get closer to him. You should be bubbling out of joy. Now, there's a difference between God's joy and happiness. Don't mistake it as happiness. Happy comes and goes. You can be slap happy, drunk happy, stoned happy. Happy is just happy. No joy, true joy of the Lord is my strength. And the joy comes up and sustains you. Say amen. Then it says peace. Who's peace? Who's the Prince of Peace? Let his peace rule in your hearts. You see, I deck the devil every morning in peace. I get up, sit in in God, and I let Jesus go. Jesus, go get him. He, sa he said to me one day, and this is a while back, if I can convey it right. I sometimes struggle with this. But he says, son... All I need is you to make me a channel to flow into. I need you to give me an invitation into people's lives who don't know to ask for themselves. I need you to invite me on their behalf, just like I came on your behalf. 
if you would just simply stop telling me what to do on such and such and invite me in to do what I know to do best at that particular time and do it that way, your prayers will be quicker, more accurate, and you'll get see more results. I hope you recorded that because I don't know if I could say that again. Our job, for example, this is what I was doing. Lord, go in and John Doe, and Lord, you can see that he's not where he needs to be. And, and Lord, he's headed off this direction. Now I'm telling God things he knows. Now, now, please, I'm just trying to bring a little humor and understanding to you. Remember, my job is to make you see it so you can understand it, so you can operate in it. And what we do is we start telling God, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead and minister him, but don't hurt him too much. You know, we start doing things like that. And let me ask you something. Is God smart? Yeah. Why are we who are limited telling God how to do his business? Why don't we do what he's asked us to do and invite him in so that he can do his business? Someone say, that's a million dollars worth of teaching. I don't know anybody else that teaches that. And I, I believe God gave it to me, not to be special, but because people need to understand that prayer is not a labor. It's not a work. It's not something you have to do. If you look at it not that way, don't bother. Not for right now. You're too self-focused, you see. Prayer is a privilege because, look, you're moving an almighty God in behalf of your prayers. You're not ordering him or commanding him, but you're giving him opportunity to flow. How did Jesus in the first place get into this planet? He was asked in here. How did Jesus get into your heart? You asked him in there. Well, it makes you think anything works any other way. So ask him into your kids. Ask him into their dreams. Ask him into their prayers. Ask him to begin to not get any pleasure out of the drugs they're using. Ask him to not want alcohol. Ask him to go into those areas so he can work and he's not limited. Say amen. amen. Woo. You've got a lot of power at your disposal. Get close to God. Look up. Let him draw you deeper. Done preached myself happy. BJ, what are you going to do about that? All right, so we got love, joy, peace, now long-suffering. This is not long-suffering, hanging out till the end. This is hanging out with Jesus and just, listen, there are times things look tough around us. That's, listen, take notes. That's the time you get quiet, you draw in, and you focus in God. No speaky, speaky too much, because you're going to hurty, hurty yourself and your prayers. You be quiet, you get in, and you reflect, and God begins to show you the plan, and then you rise up and you follow through with it. Say amen. Amen. Sometimes you want to move, but God wants you to be still. Learn the difference. God is not so busy that he can't rest. Don't you get out of balance either. Say, oh, me, someone. So love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness. The meek shall inherit the earth. Meek doesn't mean weak. It simply means you're approachable and trainable. How many here know that when you, you, you take and train a horse, did you know it's called meeking a horse? There's this big animal, and they're taught to be, they're, they're t trained and taught how to be ridden with a little reins. Now, you can ride a horse three ways. You can w ride them with tight reins, and the horse will fight against you. People that are trying to be legalistic and try to tell their people what to do, that's legalism, and they're trying to back, hold a tight rein on their congregations and stuff. We don't do that. We give you the freedom to make the choices, but please communicate and go up the line and stuff, okay? And stop looking retarded, amen? And then, or you can ride the horse with no reins. You can let the rein, where would the whole horse go? Back to the barn, won't it? It won't go anywhere you want it to go. So you learn to ride the horse with the right reins. They're loose, but you still have command. Hello, are you with me? 
Meekness is just that way. Meekness is not having you put all your effort all at one time on that spot. It's being able to take your strength and to mete it out what's needed and what's not needed. Good example of that is I put new grommets in my sink in my house years ago. Brand new. And to turn my sink off, all you have to do is just barely touch it. Just, and it's off. But then you get people who's not meek, and they'll be yanking it and pushing it and everything. If your walk is that way, you're in trouble. Slow down. Become meek. Okay, meek. You can be bold and everything, but meekness is the willingness to be trained, to be taught, and corrected. How good are you at being corrected? If I come to you and I correct you, will you take it personally? I hope not. I'm talking about performance here. Your performance has to be good, and God should be in charge of it. Amen. All right, so let's go on. Meekness, gentleness. So all of these fruit portions, it's God filling them up with his expression. So it's not just your love. It's God's love. I've had a lot of people pat, maybe you have too, pat you on the back, say, I love you, brother. And, and you know they haven't got a clue. And so I do something that causes them upset, and now they don't love me anymore. <laughs> what a baby. God, we're not to love each other with, with our love. It'll fall short. Don't love your husband or your wife with your love only. Put God's love in there. Talk about romance. Amen. And if you're not married, put your love for God and let him be your friend. Amen. All right. Let's go past. So we see the fruit of the Spirit. So who should be filling the fruit portions? God. Jesus. Amen. So let's go on to our next point. Yay. Thank you, Lord. All right. We're going to go, God checks the fruit and the harvest. Now, didn't he say something like this? Look out. The fields are already ripe for harvest. Say not there be three months and then comes the harvest. Look up. What? Look up. See. People are ready for God. Are you ready to be used of God? Are you ready to help in the harvest? Did you know there's a harvest of souls? You'll see it in the parable of the dragnet. How many has ever heard the term dragnet? A fishing net. They used to throw it out into the, into the lake, and then the net would float down, and then they'd pull it up and catch a bunch of fish. The dragnet is grace from Pentecost all the way up until the coming of the Lord, Fish are being caught in the net of salvation. Can you say amen? The angels are operating. God is gathering. And then at the end of the age, we have an account of it. The net is drawn in and God separates the different kinds of fish. Amen. Separating the sheep from the, the goats. So right now, that net is being put in and anybody that can come will come. This is the time where the people can come to Jesus they don't have to be perfect. They just come. So our job is to beckon them to come. Get them to come. Get Jesus in their heart. I told you about, I don't know, about a month ago, you could be a little sneaky about it. I hate the word sneaky. What do you mean? Well, I led a Catholic lady to the Lord in a, in a doctor's office in the waiting room. She really loved God. You could tell she really loved God. But I don't think she was born again. So I said, would you like to take another step into the things of God? This is right in the middle of a doctor's office. There's people there. My wife was watching. And she said, so went right over there, sat down with her. I talked with her, prayed with her. She accepted Jesus. He's going to take you farther in. You see, you don't slap somebody before you preach to them. You feed them. And then they'll listen. You compliment them and then you feed them you don't slap them say you sinner you better repent listen you do that that's called the law you just laid down the law and they're going to run from you you treat your children that way and they'll run from you your child comes home and you say 
Hey, sweetie, how was your day? You make them feel like there's no opposition. See, we always make people feel like they're opposed. They have to give up this to become a Christian. They have to do this. They have to do That's all a lie. Just come to Jesus. He'll clean you up. He'll clean you up. Why? Because he is love personified. His job is to clean us up. Amen. Hello? But now we get in there and sometimes middle. All right. So God checks the fruit. Go with me to Luke 13, please. Look at verse 6 through 9. Now I'm going to say this to you. When Jesus showed up, how were the Jewish people? How did they treat Jesus? Not very good. Here he is their Messiah. Do you realize the Jews, a majority of them, were told a lie that Jesus isn't the Messiah and that his disciples set this thing up? So I ran into a many a Jewish person, wonderful people, but hate Jesus with all their hearts. You mention Jesus, and they'll toss you on your ear. They'll curse you up and down. Side. What causes them to hate so much? Now, I'm not putting them down. That's just the fact. So we need to be praying that they'll open their hearts to the real Messiah. Can you say amen? And receive Jesus. Now, I know a lot of Jews that have accepted Jesus. Ben Netanyahu, the leader of Israel, is a born-again, spirit-filled man and a Jew. Okay? Awesome man. Pray for him. People can get born again, but let me tell you, just being a Jew doesn't get you to heaven. Just as good as me being Scottish. You think that's going to get me to heaven? Nope. I can bring as many bagpipes in here as I can. Making a lot of noise. It's not going to make me. It's not going to make me any better. It's my friendship with God. My intimacy with him. Gives me access to all of his kingdom and all of his equipment. Can you say Amen. People with pride can't access. That's why Satan tries to fill Christians with pride. They get their feelings hurt all the time. They're doing their own thing, and they're going to do it this way. And Listen, that's pride, and it won't work. I'm sorry. Pride cometh before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. God resisteth the proud, giveth grace to humble. What does Satan do? He tries every human being to get him full of pride. After all, I'm my own man. Survival of the fittest. Where do we get that stuff? Well, I know. You got me? He also spoke a parable. A certain man had a fig tree, that's Israel, planted in a vineyard, that's the earth, and he came seeking fruit. God seeks after what? Come on, people, what does God seek after? So therefore, be happy. Be peaceful. Get out there and win souls, touch lives. He feeds off the fruit you bring him. He's a wine press. He's a grape press. He's sucking up the wonderful fruits of your life. He loves it. You're his children. Which of you would have a child, and when the child hits a home run or does something cool or cleans their room, you don't get excited over that? What do you make think God is not the same? Okay. Amen. Look, and he said to the keeper of his vineyard, look, these three years he came seeking fruit on the fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? Now, this is God. Who is he talking about? Israelites. Now, do you remember when John the Baptist came on the scene? And everybody came out to see to John. And John says, what have you come out to see? A, a, a reed shaken in the wind? What have you come out to see? For the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Bring therefore fruit to repentance unto God. Now you know why Jesus was so broken. Because his family, the Israelites, were rejecting him. Oh, that must have hurt. Have you ever been rejected? How did it feel? Oh. 
I want my God to feel so at home that he can hang out at my house <laughs> and your house too. Oh, come on, Pastor. No, I think of things that way. I think about preparing him a meal. What's this extra plate for? This is for Jesus. I mean, and, and, and getting in that love affair with him. Believe me, some of you have got some pretty rough things you're going through. In order for you to get this thing I'm talking about, you've got to get a little closer to God and get that love affair going with him. He will never disappoint you. He will never disappoint you. Lavish on him. I mean, don't be stupid, but lavish on him. How many times have you heard me say, don't date Jesus, marry him? Right? I mean, I pick of the Christians. Hey, God, thank you for saving me. And if I have any need, I'll, I'll talk to you a little later on. Lord, I love you now, and I always will love you. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Come on, daily with God. All right. And finishing. Thank God he's finishing. Look for these three years. How many, how many years did Jesus walk amongst the Jews? Three years. Couldn't find any fruit. Cut it down. Why does it use up the space of the ground? But he answered and he said to him, Sir, this is the laborers. Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if it doesn't, cut it down. Folks, this is a prophecy to the Israelite nation. God gave them an extra grace with Jesus' last finishing, and there was no fruit. Do you remember the fig tree that Jesus sought fruit on? Do you know anything about fig trees? Well, on a fig tree, there's always fruit. It might not be ripe, but there's always fruit with the leaves. Just little pieces of, and you can eat it. It's, it's not the best. Figs are better when they're full grown. But Jesus knew there were figs on that, on that tree. And so he went to it. There was no figs, was there? And trees are supposed to bear. So he cursed it as a lesson. They came back the next day. It was cursed, withered up, drying up. And Peter showed you know, the disciples, look, look at what you curse is this way. He's showing a lesson. If you don't live with God who's life, you're going to live with a curse that's in the planet. We don't want you exposed to the curse. We don't want you in poverty or sickness. We don't want you in spiritual disarray. We want you following God, a tree planted by the rivers of water. Can you say amen? So he says, cut it down. So what happened, folks? You might not know this, but in Matthew 13, in the 12th chapter, the last verse, Jesus left the house and went to the sea. That's a symbol of Jesus left the house of Israel to go to the Gentiles. Why? Because they rejected them. In Romans, I think it's around verse 11 or so, it says, because the Jews rejected Jesus, you and I are grafted through the grace of God in Christ, and we're accepted. We're as Jewish as they can be, because we're circumcised with the condition of our heart and not with the cutting of our flesh. Can you say amen? Totally, God's in love with you. Totally in love with you. Can't figure out why you're just bumbling around. Why aren't you getting with it? Come on, I'm not picking on you too much. I'm just saying, okay. Well, all right, Lord, show me what I need to do. All right, so point one, church, our Heavenly Father desires for us to be fruitful. Say amen. amen. Two, the key to fruit, a fruitful life is allowing the nature of Christ to influence our thoughts and our actions. Say amen. Thirdly, we need to let God make the seed and the tree good. The Bible says either make the tree good and make its fruit good, or the tree will be bad and its fruit bad. How many know you can't pick good fruit from a bad fruit tree? Hello. So how do we make the tree good? High trees. Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin. God changes the seed. Now your seed is growing from heaven and not from earth. Your seed is growing from Christ and not from the earth. Ah, amen. Our roots are in God. 
So draw from him. To do this, in order for us to walk in this fruitful way, we have to surrender on a daily basis. We just have to. Let Jesus take our, our lead and walk us through our day. You'll have lots of fruit. Don't get in. Don't grab your coffee and start getting in your car, head to work, and you haven't even prayed. Have you seen the traffic out there? What is wrong with you? I pray going in and going out. Not only that, but through that prayer, God puts someone there for me to witness to. Be a consistent, habitual, be close to God person. Amen. Then Matthew 7, last scripture, Matthew 7, 16 through 20. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorn bushes or figs from thistles? That's talk about your flesh and your spirit. When I'm in the flesh, am I a happy person? I'm a thorny, thistly person. Have you ever said to somebody who's in the flesh, haven't they went, <laughs> prickly, prickly? Come on, recognize that. No, we're in the spirit, can you say amen? We're the figs and we're the grapes. We are not the thistles and the thorns. I don't want to be a thorn in your side. Amen. Why have you been on my case all this time, Pastor Kerry? I says, why haven't you done what I first asked you to do? I love the counseling. I used to counsel. I don't counsel too much anymore. You know, coming in, have a counseling appointment. I do, but I won't do it because here's what usually happens. I'll give them perfect counsel from God, and then the next week they'll come back, and I say, did you do what I asked you to do? And they say, well, no. I says, well, our counseling's done. Nothing's going to help you if you don't take your medicine. Nothing is going to help you if you don't change. Keep changing. Look in the mirror and say, I'm going to be a better person tomorrow because you're going to see that I get that way. God's such a gentleman to accept us just the way we are. But he's such an absolute genius not to leave us there. And finishing. So it goes on. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. You know when somebody's bearing bad fruit. Do you want to eat it? You'll know a tree by it. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Now, this is not talking about eternal fire. This is talking about every human being that does not accept God and change their seed is going to be cast into the fire because God can't redeem sin. He can't bring sin unto his bosom. So human beings are walking around unforgiven in sin, and yet forgiveness is right there for them to accept Jesus Christ. Where are the preachers? Where are you touching people and asking them to get born again? The church needs to start doing that more. They're too busy having carnival times. You don't believe me? Let's go up the street and visit it. You want to see carnival time? Nobody's winning souls. Nobody's learning anything, but they're having a good time. Now, there's something wrong. I'm a pastor. something wrong with kids playing all the time and not doing their homework. Now, homework's never fun. But I always used to be, later on I learned this, if I got my homework done first, I could play a whole lot more. I'm not so special. God had to show me that. Why do we wait till the last minute and then we think of 10 things we got to do on the way out the door? Stop that. Get those things done the night before. Saturday is a sanctimonious time where you don't do anything. You don't stay up late. You don't do any partying so that you're fresh in the morning for God to give you what he needs you to get. If you can't do that, then you miss the whole Sabbath idea. The whole idea of Sabbath is because people were killing themselves and working themselves to death. Satan saw to it. Average lifestyle was about 40 years old. 
Now God's given us grace and given us love, and he says, look, you've got to let me get in charge so I can teach you how to enjoy yourself, have a vacation, and you can continually have joy and rest every day of your life, even under trial, even under stress, because we all go through things. Things are out there. We have to pass through them things. Can you say amen, though? I'd rather go through them prepared than go through them as if I didn't know. Did you get something out of this this morning? Amen? Let's give the Lord a praise this morning. Amen.